This video is sponsored by AG1 by Athletic Greens. Have you ever seen anything so gloriously beautiful in all your life? Well, I'm just naturally a beautiful person. Also, I made a crosscut sled. And in this video, I'm gonna show you exactly how I did it. Not only did I make a crosscut sled, I made it with this limited edition Bourbon Moth stop block from KM Tools. And this isn't your ordinary crosscut sled. This might be the world's fanciest crosscut sled. I don't even know if I can bring myself to use it. It's so pretty. Anyways, follow along, see how I made it, build yourself one, get yourself a limited edition Bourbon Moth stop block, and if you haven't done so already, go subscribe to our other channel, Bourbon Bites. We're having a good time over there. It's all the same content that you know and love, but in small, compact, bite-size, easily digestible form. So, go take some shots of bourbon, over there, you can click up there somewhere. Anyways, let's build a crosscut sled. If you've been watching my channel for any length of time, you probably know that I've already made a crosscut sled, but that was for my old table saw and I used extruded aluminum for the fence. And I can't use extruded aluminum for my new saw because it's got that saw stop technology and the aluminum would trigger the saw stop. So I need to make a new table saw sled. And this time I decided to go all out, as fancy as I could possibly make it. And nothing says fancy like a four by eight sheet of MDF. It said nobody ever, but don't worry. By the time I'm done with this MDF, it's gonna be fancy as f Now the first thing I needed to do was cut the MDF into my, you know, various parts and pieces. So I got out my track saw and I ripped down a piece for the base of my crosscut sled. Once I ripped it to width, I went over to the table saw and I cut it to length. This isn't the safest way to cut a piece of wood to length, but don't worry, I'll have a crosscut sled soon enough and, and it'll be very safe. See? It's already starting to kind of look like a crosscut sled. Getting groovy. Next, I need to cut the pieces for the fences on my crosscut sled. And I'm going to be attaching this limited edition Bourbon Moth stop block from KM Tools. Yes, they are available on my website. So I used that to determine the height I wanted the front of my fence to be. Because, of course, I want the stop block to fit on the fence as it should. Once I figured out a rough height, I started ripping up some pieces of MDF for the front and back fences, ripping them a little wider than they needed to be so that after I glue up two pieces to get an inch and a half thick, I can run them through the joiner and get them all square and straight and all that jazz and still have material left to work with. So here I got my front fence and my back fence and my O fence. That's what I call it when I dance, because when I dance, it's offensive get it because I'm not very good at it anyways for the back fence it's got to be kind of a unique shape now if you've ever seen a crosscut sled before you know that the back fence raises up in the middle that's because when you build a crosscut sled you essentially cut it in half and because you want those two halves to stay connected the back fence needs to have this raised up part so that everything can be held together and still be strong so I traced out the shape I wanted for the back fence onto a scrap piece of quarter inch plywood. I'm gonna use this as a template to transfer that shape onto my pieces of MDF. So I cut part way through on the table saw and then I went over to the band saw to cut out most of the other excess material. Then I finished it up over on the oscillating belt sander until I had a very nice looking template, the exact shape that I wanted for the back fence on my crosscut sled. With that all taken care of, I traced out that shape onto my rough pieces of MDF. And once I had that shape, I just cut away some excess material again over on the bandsaw so that when it comes to template routing these, I won't have to take off so much material with the router bit. So with all the MDF pieces cut to the right size and shape for my fence, well, roughly to the right size and shape, I squirted some glue in between each pieces and I clamped them together. By doubling up two pieces of three quarter inch MDF, we're gonna get an inch and a half thick fence on the front and back, which will be plenty strong. I use this little Rockler glue brush, which is awesome because it's got 
like a squeegee on one end so you can smooth all the glue out right where you want it. And enough clamps. This stuff is not going anywhere. Ooh. Ah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Now, if you thought up to this point that my crosscut sled was going to be completely made out of MDF, well, you're just crazy, that's what. No, I'm going to use the MDF as a substrate, but really, the true beauty is this walnut laminate that I'm going to put on top. Now, no, this isn't real walnut. It's walnut laminate, or formica. It's the type of material that you might see on a kitchen counter. It's the same stuff that I put on my work tables and my outfeed table because nothing sticks to it and it's really easy to keep it clean and maintain it and keep it looking nice for a long time. It's also very easy to cut. You don't need any power tools whatsoever. All you need is a straight edge, a tape measure, and a scorer. No, not somebody who keeps score in a soccer game, but a little tool that etches a line on top of the laminate. Once you etch your line exactly where you want it, it's as simple as just folding the laminate over until, ooh, wait for it, snap. It breaks, and there you have it. If you score it correctly, you can get good, crisp, clean edges by cutting it this way. Of course, I'm cutting all of my pieces a little bit bigger than they need to be so they overhang my MDF, and once we get it attached to the MDF, well, we'll come back with a flush trim router bit and we'll clean it all up until it's real purdy. But for now, I set to work just cutting all my various pieces of laminate. Score, score, snap. Score, score, snap. Score, score, snap. It's really that easy, and it's quite satisfying. Sometimes when I'm bored, I come out to the shop and I just break apart pieces of laminate just for the fun of it. Maybe you will too after this video. By the time I got all my pieces of laminate roughly cut to size, it was ready to take my stock pieces of MDF out of clamps. Now I thought I might have to work with my front fence a little bit, you know, on the joiner to get it square. And I was right, I did. <laughs> so after running it through the joiner to make sure that I had two very, very flat edges, I did the same thing with my back fence, although this one's not nearly as important because we're not using it as a reference surface to make any cuts. Then I went over to the table saw and my front fence was easy because it was just a rectangle. So I cut it down to the right height so that it would work with that stop block I showed you earlier. Now my back fence has this funky shape. So I took my template that we made earlier and I stuck it to my glued up blank of MDF with a little double-sided carpet tape. This tape is insanely strong. and It's the only tape I like to use on templates. There is a link in the video description. Then I, you know, cut off all the excess I could over on the miter saw, strapped on a mask because MDF is nasty stuff, got my bits and bits half inch shank compression bit all chalked up in my router table and started making some MDF dust. A lot of it. Now you can see why I was wearing a mask. But pretty soon I had my back template all cut out and it was looking pretty crisp as well as pretty clean if I do say so myself. And with that, we were well on our way to making a crosscut sled. I got my front fence right here, and I've got my back fence right here, and you can kinda see it start to take shape. It's just ugly MDF. But don't worry, we're gonna fix that right now. Now, applying laminate to a substrate is almost as easy as cutting laminate. All you need is a little contact cement. The brand I like to use is this Weld Wood contact cement. This is also pretty nasty stuff, so I recommend you wear a mask when applying it. I did not, and I probably should have. Although I did have my garage door open, all my windows open, and a fan running. But still, you should probably wear a mask. Anyways, the way contact cement works is you just apply contact cement to both sides of the material that you want to stick together, and then you wait for it to dry. Once it's dry and is pressed together, it creates a chemical reaction which adheres the two pieces. So, with all of my contact cement dry, I just took my laminate and I stuck it to the top. Now, you don't want to just throw it on there all willy-nilly because you can get air bubbles. So I like to start in the middle and slowly work my way to the outside edges, just firmly pressing as I go until everything is on there nice and secure. 
and then they make these laminate rollers that allow you to get nice even pressure over the entire surface and make sure that it's stuck down really good. So after I did my back fence, I did my front fence, and after I did my front fence, I did my base plate. Now when you're applying laminate to bigger surfaces, sometimes it's nice to put some dowels or pieces of PVC or scrap pieces of wood, or in this case, golden T-track that I'm gonna use later in the saw on top of your substrate. That way you can set the laminate down on top of those pieces without it immediately sticking, get everything lined up exactly where you want it, and then stick it to your substrate. Again, I like to start in the middle and then slowly work my way to the outside. Just remember that once one thing with contact cement on it comes in contact with another thing with contact cement on it, it's not gonna wanna come apart. So don't stick them together until you're ready for them to be stuck. That's wisdom right there. And just like that, I have one side of everything laminated. That's right. We've got to do this whole process over again on the other side. But first I pulled out my trim router with a spiral down cut flush cut bit from Bits and Bits and I cleaned up all my edges. Now I could have done this after I already added laminate to the other side but I was worried with the overhang that I would catch it on the edge of the table and chip out a big chunk and I thought it was just safer to get one side all flush trimmed before moving on to the other side. So that's exactly what I did. And then I moved on to the other side and yes, we had to repeat this entire process over again, applying more contact cement to both the MDF and the back of the laminate and then taking the laminate and sticking it on to the MDF. I gotta tell you, this is really fun. It's like a giant sticker for adults. It's just cool and it looks like a table that your grandmother probably had in 1970. So that's also very fun. With laminate stuck on the secondary surface of all of my pieces, once again, I picked up that trim router with that flush trim bit and I cut everything flush. And then the last thing I had to do was add laminate to the top and sides of my front fence and my back fence. So it was back to the contact cement, back to the laminate, and then very carefully, I just worked my way along and stuck the pieces onto my fences. As you can see, there's quite an overhang, but don't worry, we'll come back and clean all that up at the end. In other words, right now. To clean this up, I used a flush trim chamfer bit and just gave a slight little bevel to every single edge. It exposed a tiny bit of that MDF, but it gave the whole thing a very clean look. One of the hardest places to apply the laminate to was the back fence, because I had some pretty tight curves back there. I opted to do this in two pieces rather than one long piece, so there was a slight seam in the middle on the top of the fence. But it was pretty hard to see. I mean, that's a lie. You can see there's a seam there, but it's YouTube, so I'm going to say that it was pretty hard to see and hope that you guys don't notice. It is, after all, a crosscut sled, so ease up a little bit. With all of my pieces completely laminated at this point, I wanted to do a little more work to the base plate for my crosscut sled. So I took this little radius template and I double-sided taped it onto the bottom and using that same flush trim router bit, I added a little radius to each corner. Again, this is just to prevent any chip out or, you know, snagging the corner of the crosscut sled on your genitals as you walk by. You know, all the major shop hazards that can happen. Then I took that same chamfer bit, I added a pretty heavy chamfer to the bottom of the sled and then a lighter chamfer on the top. I did a heavier one on the bottom because I didn't want that to catch on anything, like the corner of my table saw. With that all complete, now I needed to add some of this gold T-track onto the back side of my front fence so that I could attach my awesome custom Bourbon Moth stop block. So using my dado saw, I just added a little rabbit to the back edge of that front fence, fingers crossed and praying like crazy that I wouldn't get any major chip out on that laminate, and I didn't. Thank the good Lord. 
As you can see with this rabbet on the back edge, it gives me the perfect shelf to set this T-track and then attach that stop block. There's just one more thing I want to do to that front fence, and that is add another chamfer on the inside bottom edge. This is a step that a lot of people miss when they're making a crosscut sled, and I've missed it in the past as well. What this chamfer does is it gives a place for excess sawdust to land when you're making multiple cuts. If you don't know what I mean, I'll show you right here. Let's say you got a bunch of sawdust and you're trying to push something flush against your fence. Well, without the chamfer, that sawdust pushes your piece away from the fence and it can hurt the accuracy of your cut. But by adding that little chamfer, it gives a place for that sawdust to go and you can still get flush contact with your fence. With that done, I was ready to attach permanently my T-Track on top of the fence and things are starting to look pretty darn good. Well, hi ho Good subscriber, neighbor, you might be wondering, why is Jason in such a fantastic mood? Seems like he's got a little bit more energy, he looks toned and happy. Well, that's because this video is sponsored by our good friends over at AG1 by Athletic Greens. Now, if you're like me, you probably made some New Year's resolutions. One of my resolutions was to get old Rip Van Winkle here. One of my other resolutions was to take better care of my body and make sure that I was getting all the vitamins and nutrients and minerals that I needed. The problem is, it's really hard for me to sit down and take a break from work and eat a balanced meal and make sure that that meal includes everything that my body needs. It's just stressful. You see, AG1 is comprehensive daily nutrition made powerfully simple. It's made up of 75 whole food sourced ingredients like vitamins, minerals, adaptogens, probiotics, superfoods, all right here somehow magically in this little can. When we're feeling our best, we just show up better. And so I've started making it my daily routine that every morning I wake up and I drink a glass of AG1. I'm gonna show you how much of an effortless daily habit AG1 is. You wake up in the morning, you see your glass, you fill it with eight to 12 ounces of water, you take a scoop of the AG1 powder, you put it in there like that, you put the lid on, you shimmy, 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 shake, 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 like you're making a good old martini, it's ready to go, and you drink it. If you want to try AG1, which I'm sure you do, you're going to want to go to athleticgreens.com slash bourbon moth. And right now, the good folks over at Athletic Greens are giving all of my subscribers five free travel packets plus a one-year supply of their immune-supporting vitamin D3 plus K2 when you sign up. So go check the link in the video description and try AG1 today. You will not regret it. Now that our laminate's all pretty, I'm going to cut a hole right in the middle for a removable insert. And I'm also going to take some T-Track and I'm going to put them on the outside edges for some hold down clamps. And to do all this, I'm going to be using the Shaper Origin. Now you could use a regular router. It would just take a little longer to get everything set up. You might have to make some jigs and templates. But the nice thing about the Shaper Origin, hashtag not sponsored, is that you can just trust the machine. It's basically a handheld CNC machine. So first you put down the shaper tape and you scan your surface. It then takes that surface and makes a digital mock-up of it on the machine that you can see. Then you can design all the little pieces you want to cut out. I got two pieces of T-Track on either side and my removable insert in the middle. And then you just start cutting. And as long as you're within a half inch of your line on either side, the machine will auto-correct and make sure that you have a perfect, precise cut every time. Which is pretty foolproof. So yes, you can be mad at me for pulling out a $2,000 router, but don't be mad at the results, because they look pretty sweet. In no time, I cut out a quarter inch deep hole for my removable insert, and I cut out an insert to match. By making the insert removable, I can always have a zero clearance insert in there. I can change it out if it ever gets chunked up. And if I want to switch out a dado stack, well, I can just make a new insert for the dado stack. After cutting out my slot for the insert, I cut out all my slots on either side of the insert for my T-Track. And things are starting to look, well, not great yet, but just wait till we get the T-Track in there. Then it's really gonna look sweet. 
Speak of the devil, with all my shaper tape removed, I marked my T-track to length and I went over to my miter saw to cut it down because it's aluminum and aluminum cuts like butter on the miter saw. And you feel cool because you're cutting metal, like you have superpowers or something. Anyways, with my pieces cut to the right length, I inserted them into my freshly cut out slots and they fit perfect. Now you might be wondering why I left a hole at the top. That's because we need a space to insert our bolt for the T-Track so that we can add and remove the hold down clamps. Then I just worked my way down the line, knocking in that T-Track with a little plastic mallet. As you can see, it slid in nice and tight and was really taking this crosscut sled from cool to, you know, cold because that's what comes after cool and then I tapped in that removable insert I'll come back and secure all these later but for now I needed to also cut a removable insert on the front edge of my front fence and on the back side of my front fence and on the front edge of my back fence so that I can keep those looking crisp and clean all the time as well so back over to the shaper to cut some nice half moon shaped, you know, shapes on the front and back of my fences. And while I was at it, I also cut the corresponding plywood inserts. This is just white oak veneered quarter inch plywood because we might as well mix a little white oak and walnut if we're making the world's fanciest crosscut sled. I marked these pieces to the right size and I Duck them in there. Now you might be asking yourself, yeah, but how are you going to actually affix these temporary inserts to the crosscut sled? Well, don't worry. I have a plan for that. And it comes in the form of double sided carpet tape. Now, if you're saying there's no way double sided tape is going to be strong enough to hold those inserts in there, you obviously have never used this tape to hold down a template because it is insanely strong and it will work just fine to hold these small quarter inch templates in place until I'm ready to switch them out. So one generous piece of carpet tape and my quarter inch inserts are temporarily affixed until I should so choose to remove them or replace them. Now all of the inserts I left as just regular white oak ply except for this one on the very front of my fence. If you've ever used a crosscut sled before, you know that this area where the blade passes through the front of the fence can be a bit of a danger zone because if you're not paying attention, you can put your finger there unknowingly and, well, chop your finger off. So I decided I wanted to draw a little more attention to this insert. So like any true woodworker would do, I got out a red Sharpie and I just colored it in red. And to remind myself a little bit more, I cut off the end of one of my stickers and I stuck it on there as a reminder of exactly what will happen if I put my fingers there. Now some people put big wooden blocks to protect the blade so that it never actually comes out, but that's ugly. And this is a fancy crosscut sled. So danger before ugliness, as I always say. Next, it was time to attach our base to our miter slot runners. I got these on Amazon. I think they're nylon or some plastic material. I just cut them to length. I measured the distance from the edge of my base plate to the center where the blade's gonna come through. And then I brought over my table saw fence that distance. This just happened to be 22 inches. Now to attach these runners to the bottom of our plate, we gotta raise them above the surface of the table saw. So I just used a few nickels from my son's piggy bank, stuck them in my miter gauge slots, and set the runners on top. This raised them up just enough so that they can make contact with the bottom of the sled. Then I added a little double-sided tape to the top of each one of those runners, and I peeled off that yellow protective backing to engage the stickiness. Now, if you do the next part right, you can pretty much wind up with a sled base that is already perfectly lined up with your saw blade. 
you want to stick the sled base tight against your fence, which should be perfectly parallel to your blade, and slowly lower it down onto those runners. When they come in contact with the runners, and more importantly, the double-sided tape, they should stick to the runners, and now those runners are temporarily affixed to the bottom of your plate exactly where they need to be to line up with your miter slots. And that looks something like this. Voila. Nickels. Tape. Magic. Now that we know the runners are in the right place, we can pre-drill through all the little holes. You know, a little pilot hole action, because it's hard to get a screw started through that laminate. And then we permanently screw them to the bottom of the sled. Once they are permanently attached, we have the makings of a nice crosscut sled. Now it's time to attach our front fence. Now it's very important that your front fence is square to your blade. So I wanted to make this fence adjustable so that after you attach it, if you needed to tweak it, you could and ensure that you have a perfectly square cut. So this is the solution I came up with to make the front fence adjustable. I marked out on the bottom of the sled exact center of the fence on the top of the sled. Now these are the bolts that I'm gonna to use to attach the fence to the sled. It doesn't really matter what size Forsner bit you use, it just needs to be significantly larger than the head of that bolt. Now we're not drilling all the way into the sled, we're just drilling enough to countersink the head of that bolt on the bottom of the sled. And like I said, you want it bigger than the head of the bolt because that bolt's gonna to need to move around within that countersunk circle. You'll see what I'm talking about here in just a second. With our countersunk holes drilled on the bottom of the sled, we're gonna flip it back over and expose the top again. Now we're gonna line up our front fence and try and get it as square to our base as we possibly can. We're gonna clamp it in place and make sure everything is looking good. With the fence securely clamped so it can't move, we're gonna flip the whole sled back over so we can once again see those countersunk holes we drilled with the Forsner bit. Then we're gonna take an 11 32nd inch drill bit and we're gonna drill through the base plate of the sled and into the fence, just a little bit farther than the length of our bolts that we're gonna use. Now, as you can see, the bolts have a lot of play within that hole and that's what's gonna give us our adjustability on the fence. With our holes now drilled all the way through our base plate and into our fence, we're gonna unclamp the fence and we're gonna insert some threaded inserts. I like to just squeeze a little bit of CA glue on the outside of the threaded insert and then use the appropriate sized Allen key to twist the insert into place. And keep twisting until the insert head is just below the surface of the fence. So it doesn't get in the way of anything wipe off any excess CA glue, and repeat this step on your three remaining holes. There's gonna be four bolts holding this fence to the base in total. Then we're gonna stick our fence on the bottom side, get it lined up with our pre-drilled holes, and we're gonna use our bolts to screw it back on. Now, if you got your holes all lined up really nice and even, Theoretically, this should already be pretty square to your blade, but we won't know for sure until we make our first cut. Next, we're going to attach our back fence. Now, our back fence doesn't need any adjustability because we're not gonna use it as a reference surface, it's just kind of there for stability. So we don't have to be nearly as careful with attaching our back fence as the front fence. So to attach our back fence, I'm just gonna use this Armana countersink bit, drill some countersunk holes in the bottom and screw the back fence in place. So after I drill all my countersunk holes, I insert some two or three inch screws. I don't remember exactly, but they were long enough to, you know, securely hold the back fence on. And I removed my clamps. Now the back fence is secured on there, the front fence is secured on there and able to be adjusted, and the whole thing slides nice and smooth. There's just one thing left to do. Make our first cut. Now I really didn't want to have a bunch of chip out on our beautiful inserts when I made that first cut. So on the back fence and the front of the front fence, I just double-sided taped a little scrap piece of MDF as kind of a, you know, wasteboard to 
to ensure a clean cut. Then I raised my saw blade all the way up, as high as it would go, I turned the saw on, and I cut my sled in half. Oh my gosh. But, let's be honest, it had to be done. It had to be done. That's what you do with a crosscut sled. Thankfully, it all worked exactly as it should. It cut very nice, and we'll see in just a second if the MDF prevented any tear out. And we'll take a look at that right... Oh, hey, look at that. That looks pretty darn good, if I do say so myself. And this one? Oh, ho, ho, hello there. Yeah, how are you doing? Very nice. Now, because I only used three quarter inch material for my base, I can still cut up to two and a quarter inches with my saw raised to the full height, which means I can cut up to eight quarter material, which is plenty for a crosscut sled. Then I was gonna square up the fence to the blade, but when I stuck a square on there and ran it across, I was shocked to find out that it was pretty dead nuts. I'll confirm this later with the five cut method. If you don't know what that is, look it up on YouTube. It's a way to ensure that your saw blade is perfectly square to your fence. Anyways, next I attached my beautiful custom limited edition Bourbon Moth stop block and it was time to add our metallic self-adhering tape measures. So I very carefully made sure that these were properly lined up with where the blade was using that stop block as a reference. I added one to the left, I added another one to the right, and I was just about ready to crosscut sled all night. That rhymed, in case you didn't realize it. Now the really awesome thing about this stop block is once you tighten it down, there is zero deflection. Hands down, the best stop block on the market. So if you need one for your crosscut sled or miter saw station, this is the one to get. It's available on my website. You can flip it around backwards if you're not using it to keep it out of the way. There's a link in the video description. Another great thing to add to this are these Rockler hold down clamps. They fit right in that T-track. If you're cutting a piece at an angle and you want to hold it down with these clamps because it's a little safer, you can put them on, you can take them off, and boom. We have ourselves a freaking fancy crosscut sled. I can't wait to use this thing or not use this thing. I might just put it on a shelf and stare at it because it's just so pretty. Hey, well, there you have it. We made a crosscut sled. Don't forget, get your limited edition Bourbon Moth stop block. There's a link down in the video description. There's also links to all the different products you're gonna need to build your own sled. So, get to work. I gotta figure out where I'm gonna put this. Maybe a glass case on my mantle or next to my bed. Oh, maybe I'll take it to dinner with me tonight. That's a good idea.